Hello and welcome back to our Math 200 lecture series for Kenyatta College. We're using PowerPoint presentations created from Mario Triola's textbook, Essentials of Statistics, 5th edition. My name is Ray Lapus. We are in Chapter 5, Probability Distributions. Our main focus in this chapter is to combine ideas that we learn from chapters 2 and 3, descriptive statistics, and what we learn in chapter 4, probabilities. These would combine into the ideas of probability distributions. And these probability distributions will give us some idea of what will probably happen in a particular scenario. And what we'll do with that is we'll compare it to what actually did happen and then draw some sort of conclusion about the particular data that we collected. Our first steps will be defining random variables and identifying discrete and continuous random variables. From here, we will build probability distributions. And in this first section, we will talk about binomial distributions. In the next chapter, we will study probably one of the most important distributions. And that is called the normal distribution. Here's a nice little mind map of how probability distributions might work. We have the idea of having babies and out of two births we can ask ourselves how many girls. In chapters 2 and 3 we collected data and so we would have what we would think about as a frequency table or a relative frequency table. In chapter 4, we found the actual true probabilities of getting no girls, getting one girl, or getting two girls. And so in this chapter, we will create these theoretical models to help us draw conclusions about our collected data. Section 5-2, Probability Distributions. The idea in this section is to take a look at probability distributions, define them, and study them. And then we will take a look at when things might be unusual or not likely to occur. Our first and very important definition is a random variable. So a random variable is essentially a variable that has a numerical value. Each of the random variables has an associated probability and this probability will build our probability distribution. The probability distribution can be expressed as a graph, a table, or a formula. We'll use a combination of these but mainly we'll focus on graphs and tables. A discrete random variable is a random variable that has a finite or countable number of values. And when we say countable, we mean countable like we can count them 1, 2, 3, etc. So even though it might go to infinity, the idea is that we're still able to count them. A continuous random variable has infinitely many values and what we can think about in a continuous random variable is that we can fill in the gaps between the whole numbers like between 1 and 2 there is a 1.5 and then there's 1.25, 1.75 etc. So everything gets filled in within the real number line. Some important requirements for a discrete probability distribution are as follows. One, we have to make sure that each value corresponds to a probability. 
two, when we add up all these probabilities, we should get it to equal to one. And three, each of these probabilities must be a value between zero and one. Here's an example of a probability histogram where we're able to look at a probability distribution from a graphical point of view. If you notice the y-axis, the vertical scale, it shows probabilities. So this is similar to our histogram, except instead of looking at the counts or the frequencies, we're looking at the probabilities. Now we will relate these probability distributions to our descriptive statistics. Each of these distributions has a mean, a variance, or a standard deviation. And here are the formulas for our mean, variance, and standard deviations. A common term used when studying probability distributions is the expected value. Expected value for a discrete random variable is the sum of x times p of x. You might think that this looks familiar, and in fact, if we take a look at the previous slide, we see that this is the exact same formula as the mean. So the expected value is another name for the mean. Here's an example. The table describes the probability of the number of girls in two births. So by using probability, we can find the probability of having no girls out of two births, one girl out of two births, or two girls out of two births. We're asked to find the mean, variance, and standard deviation. So we would extend the table to help us find the combinations of x and p of x. So we can just do the multiplication across the tables and use the formula. And then down at the totals, we can add them up. So the sum of x times p of x is 1. And then the sum of that more complicated x minus mu squared times p of x formula is 0.5. So therefore, we can state that our mean or expected value is equal to 1, our variance is equal to 0.5, and our standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance, and in this case that simplifies to about 0.707. We've seen the range rule of thumb back when we were studying the mean and standard deviation in chapter 3. So the idea is that if you're within two standard deviations of the mean, you have a set of usual values. Anything outside of that would be considered unusual. So based on our example, we found that the mean is 1 and the standard deviation is about 0.7. So using these values, the maximum value of the number of girls you would expect is 2.4, and the minimum value is negative 0.4. Now I know that's kind of weird because if you have two kids, you don't expect to have more than two kids and 2.4, or you don't expect to have a negative number of kids at negative 0.4. That just shows that this particular example all the possibilities would be usual values. Now, if we had somebody who had 10 or 11 kids, then this example might be a little bit more interesting because then you would count the number of girls and I'm pretty sure that it would be unusual to have 11 girls if you had 11 kids. The rare event rule for inferential statistics is a common rule that we'll be visiting over and over again. It states here, if under a given assumption, the probability of a particular observed event is extremely small, 
then we can conclude that the assumption is probably not correct. So let's say we assume that we have a fair coin and then a fair tosser of the coin. That person tosses the coin a thousand times and gets 992 heads. So this particular event says that, well, the assumption was probably not correct. The assumption that the coin is fair was probably not correct. So there might be something going on with the coin or something going on with the way somebody tosses a coin. So that's the idea behind the rare event rule. In this last slide, we take a look at identifying unusual results using probabilities. So the idea is that if the probability is less than 5% for getting something that's more than a particular value or getting something that's less than a particular value, then we would consider that unusually high or unusually low. So there will be more on this as we dive deeper into probability distributions. That is the end of section 5-2.